During his time here in Neri, radical Presbyterian Dr. William Drennan was contemplating the need for an organization to achieve independence. Writing to Dr. William Bruce, it is my fixed opinion that no freedom will ever be attained by this country but by total separation from Britain. And on the 18th of October, a society to achieve this ends would be founded at Drennan's suggestion and Theobald Wolftone would give it its name, the United Irishmen. Before the French Revolution, radical Presbyterians like Drennan believed the Catholics were basically controlled solely by the whims of the church. But by seeing a revolution take place in a Catholic country, Drennan became convinced of the Catholic community's revolutionary potential. And on the 17th of July, 1792, a group of Neary men would prove their revolutionary potential when they would gather at the Crown Tavern on Hill Street to send their congratulations to the French government on the fall of the Bastille, along with a small sum of £173. O'Hanlon's Crown Tavern would be the central organising spot for radicals and rebel activity in the town. It would be on the 18th of August, 1792, where Theobald Wolftone himself would come to the town of Neary and met Patrick O'Hanlon along with a group of other sympathetically minded people. And they had a meeting and Wolftone suggested a formation of a branch of the United Irishmen in Neary, to which he records in his diary was greeted with much relish. Around a month later, on the 20th of, 20th of September, it was recorded in the Neary Chronicle of the foundation of the Union Society and in an order signed by Patrick O'Hanlon is written it is we believe it was never was the intention of our creator that we should persecute each other on account of any difference of our modes of worship and from that point on that's where most activity was sort of organized that's where most rebels in the time although the Crown Tavern wasn't exclusively a rebel location. People of all stripes came to the Crown Tavern just to have a drink. And in the February of 1796, United Irishmen would be outlawed. It became illegal to administer the oath of the United Irishmen under the Insurrection Act. Despite that, Organising for the United Irishmen still continued, and in continued so in Neary. And even though their group was outlawed, they were known to taunt loyalists in the pub. There's an account from a Charles Clark, where he records sitting in the pub and there's a, a group of what he presumes are rebels, uh, getting quite loud and rowdy, but he can't hear exactly what they're singing. He, he tilts his head, he thinks, that sounds like they're singing God Save the, God Save the King, pardon me. And then eventually, the singing reaches such a crescendo, and they're not singing God Save the King. They're singing... So you can imagine that annoyed Mr. Clark, and he had the uh, person who was singing this, the tune reported. Though they attempted to outlaw the Irishmen, it seemed to have no effect on their actual recruiting. The momentum of the United Irishmen organizing didn't seem to falter, and it reached the point where loyalists were starting to get very frightened of what was an obvious insurrection brewing. William Pollock wrote to Dublin Castle from Neary, alarmed at the state of the town, saying that there were so many rebels in the town that if they were to rise up, they would last 10 minutes before they were all butchered. The authorities in the town were beginning to come down hard on the rebels. The Limerick Chronicle on the 31st of May 1797 reports on arms being seized in the town and several members of the community arrested in connection with the United Irishmen. While General Lake was seen to have taken the utmost care to seize arms, George Anderson was still unsatisfied with the measures taken, writing that the disarming was rather unsuccessful as the Republicans were aware of it. Also in the Limerick Chronicle, they reported that several members of the town were arrested, such as John Gordon. 
whose wife rushed to Belfast on the back of a horse as quickly as she could get there to petition for John's release. Though unfortunately, upon her arrival in Belfast, the horse had died from exhaustion for the journey. Having already attempted to disarm the town, troops were deployed. A cavalry regiment from North Wales called the Ancient Britons were sent to Neary, and their conduct is recorded as very much less than admirable. The behaviour of the Ancient Britons is a typical example of the level of brutality employed in order to crush the rebellion. Often the victims of this brutality were not even the people who were directly involved with the United Irishmen. Captain John Gifford, after returning from a separate engagement, returned to regroup with the main body of soldiers, to which he is said he was directed by the smoke and flame of burning houses. He records walking past dead bodies of boys, old men, who were killed by the Britons in search of arms, to which there are evidently were none. Gifford further elaborates, I shall answer to Almighty God, I believe not a single gun was fired, but by the Britons or with the yeomanry. There were many all across the island who took part in the open rebellions of the 1798 rebellion, and to be involved in these was treason. And the punishment for treason was death. And in Neary, we have the memory of people who were executed in connection with the rebellion, and they would have been taken through the tunnel in the old jailhouse and brought up to Gallows Hill to be executed. This is the memory we have of one Cochrane and Lowndes. So I'm here in Heather Park, formerly Gallows Hill, in front of St. Patrick's Church, where rebels would have been executed. Now the story of Cochrane goes that after the Battle of Ballinahinch, he fled back to Neary and bribed a lady to hide him for safety, explaining I am a rebel, I am wanted for taking part in the rebellion, and if they do find me, I will be executed. So he bribed her with a, a small sum of money, but unfortunately for Mr. Cochrane, uh, the British had paid her more. Uh, she turned him over to the British where he was held in the Linen Hall barracks and then sentenced to death, brought up from the tunnel here up to be hung, drawn and quartered. And the story goes that his head was displayed on a spike uh, round about Marcus Square and his father, in order to give him a proper Christian burial, requested that he be given the head and the British agreed to do this on the condition that he carried the head up to St. Patrick's Church going, this is my son, the head of the traitor. Now, that's a, one of the more popular sort of Halloween tales to tell about the town of Neary. And th it was the primary reason for me wanting to study specifically the 1798 rebellion in Neary, because I wanted to try and see if I could find any proof of this happening. And unfortunately, it is mostly just a folktale. I can't find any hard evidence for any of the finer details, especially the incident with his father carrying the head off to the church. We do have a record from a Mr. Alan MacDonald published on the 19th of January, 1898, a hundred years after the fact, where he describes, where he describes the fate of Thomas Lones. And very similar, he's hung, drawn and quartered, had his head on a spike, but nothing about the father bringing the head up to the thing. So, and having looking, looking, looked into it myself, I can't seem to find any court-martial for Thomas Lones or George Cochran, uh, or any other sentence, or death certificate. Uh, I indeed find a bit of trouble trying to find uh, Cochran's gravestone, uh, but it is indeed up there. Uh, there is a photograph of the family, the Cochran family uh, headstone, uh, we do have a record of a Mr. William McGill uh, from Loch Brickland who was executed on the 2nd of June 1798. So indeed there were people here executed in connection to the re rebellion uh, along with people sentenced to transportation. So what I found in this is when you're studying history, unfortunately there are some stories which 
they don't state exactly what happened with 100% accuracy. But what we do have are sources that paint a picture around the events that happened. Perhaps the, from the account that I read, maybe they're getting the name wrong. Maybe it was indeed William McGill and not Lones who was hung, drawn and quartered. But one thing that we can say, at least for certain, is that something so traumatic happened to one of the rebels of 1798 in Neri that it has had a lasting impact on the memory of the people of the town.